So, morning everyone, Sean Taylor here from Data IQ. Um, just thought it would be very helpful to sort of set the scene a little bit before we hand over to Steve to get into the, the detail of the project that he's been leading. Um, but just wanted to tell you a bit about Data IQ and, and our software platform to set the scene. Um, perhaps we could go to the, the next slide, Steve, if that's okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yep, so Data IQ, you know, what is it and who are we? Well, um, we're, we're a software platform um, working with the NHS um, in the area of data science, advanced analytics, machine learning, AI. Um, you know, what's different about Data IQ and you know, um, why, why we're so proud of the platform? Well, a couple of things, really. Um, if, first of all, Data IQ really is for everybody, um, you know, irrespective of your technical knowledge. Um, you, know, you might feel as though machine learning and data science is a bit scary, and um, we're here to perhaps demystify that, actually. So um, Data IQ is very simple and easy to use, as I'm sure Steve will talk to you a bit later on. Um, so irrespective of whether you're um, a coder in R and, and Python, or whether you're an analyst that uses Excel, um, whether you're a, a data engineer that perhaps uses SQL, or whether you're you know, really a, a frontline clinician, actually, um, you know, anybody can use Data IQ. And what Data IQ is all about is collaboration and bringing all those different skill sets and personas together and allowing, dare I say, um, less technical people with, um, let's say, less advanced data science skills to really dive into this really interesting area of machine learning and data science. Um, the other thing about Data IQ is that um, irrespective of where you are in the data science life cycle, you know, Data IQ can help you. I mean, whether, whether you're at the very early stages and you're looking at really just bringing in data and exploring that data, you know, maybe cleaning that data and wrangling it, you know, Data IQ can help. You know, right the way through to you know, when you're ready, um, building out models, uh, machine learning and predictive models. You know, right the way through to you're deploying and manage, you're managing those models in a production environment and, and managing all the, the governance and the you know, responsible AI, if you like, practices and governance of all of those models in a live production environment. So Data IQ can help you every step of the way, really. Uh, and to that uh, end as well, the third point here is we do have a number of pre-packaged uh, pre solutions that can help accelerate your data science and machine learning journey. Um, so um, that's really enough about data IQ. Um, um, I'll hand over to Steve and he can really talk you through how he's been using the platform on his project. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, so yes, I'm uh, Steve Nash. I'm a um, data reporting manager at NEL CSU. And uh, in our team, what we um, what we do is we sort of work with um, the NHS England London uh, regional team and part of that uh, remit is to give the business intelligence support for um, the medical directorates which is quite, quite. service focused um, around things like kidney problems, um, end of life care, diabetes and things like that so it's less about sort of the uh, the contractual management with hospitals and it's more about actually looking a deep dive you know quality things about actual services and how do we kind of improve um, outcomes so what we wanted to do here um, if I move to the next slide is we we really wanted to see how can we um, kind of best best provide that business intelligence support using statistical modeling um, predictive analytics so actually can we can we do something which is um, helps the prevention sort of agenda and through our other pieces of work with the London um, Kidney Network which is um, a network set up for a group of clinicians across um, London um, who are uh, have a kind of quality um, and oversight uh, remit within renal um, care diabetes you know kidney transplants things like that um, can we build can we um, have a proof of concept which can say actually if we partner with Data IQ, um, can we use this uh, software um, which they have to really um, make some kind of positive change within that within that um, healthcare uh, sector? So we um, we also really wanted to kind of build the um, the 
the uh, skills up of the team. Um, so only some of us sort of had had experience using this before. And we thought, well, actually working on something real and tangible is a kind of a great way of, of producing that. So after some sort of discussions with our London Kidney Network colleagues, which included business intelligence people as well as um, clinical uh, nephrology consultants, we then settled on a use case, which is OK, we know that the data that we've got, we've got um, we know who in our population have chronic kidney disease. We know which of those patients go on to then need hospital care. Can we predict the um, which patients will go into um, hospital care? And can we identify what risk factors are more likely for those patients to need an emergency admission? So that was at the front of the um, of the proof of concept. And you know, there, there's lots of reasons for kind of wanting to do that clinically. You know, if you prevent someone going into hospital, then you're more likely to avoid those worse hospital, um, those worse uh, clin um, health deteriorations and, and adverse kind of outcomes as well. We also um, thought it was quite a simple question, which, you know, people can understand and we can explain well. Um, there's a lot of focus within the NHS England region around health inequalities and things like that and trying to um, reduce any avoidable um, poor outcome as a result of any, you know, age, um, ethnicity, gender, uh, deprivation level of where people live. So we thought actually we've got that demographic information about patients as well. We can kind of shine a light on that systems as well. And we can avoid, hopefully, if we can reduce emergency admissions, we can reduce cost and free up beds and free up staff, which, you know, as we all know, NHS runs kind of close to occupancy on emergency um, outcomes, emergency admissions. So anything that we can do is great. And also um, we with these different data sets, we can really kind of test the linkages across those different data sets as well. So quite a useful internal sort of exercise. Um, so the board, you know, objectives we had going into the project, we wanted to build up the um, skills and knowledge within our team. Um, we did want to get a model which we thought was had was um, accurate and repeatable and uh, made sense. Um, we we're working with clinicians, you know, one of the things we really wanted to do was kind of use that knowledge and experience and the valuable time that they have is to test any hypotheses that they had and perhaps they hadn't had the opportunity to test it before. So perhaps it was something they saw, you know, anecdotal in their practice, uh, which they wanted us to look to see if we could find a result for that. Um, which we could do. Um, and also, as I say, we want to help analyse health inequalities and also outcomes. So once patients actually go into hospital, what happens when they're there? Are certain um, groups of patients more likely to pass away in hospital? Are they more likely to um, stay for longer than they should be in hospital? So this is a bit about what we did. So um, kind of breaking this down, on the left there, we've got our uh, SQL server. So we had to do a bit of um, prep work before we could use the um, Data IQ um, DSS Data Science Studio um, software. So we we looked at our data and we took it from a number of different sources. So we've got primary care data, um, which tells us for all patients or almost all patients kind of registered with um, general practice, which of them have um, chronic kidney disease which of them also have other key comorbidities. So clinicians told us, you know, they would expect certain comorbidities, uh, which would give a heightened risk factor to these patients to be um, cancer, um, hypertension, diabetes. So we could look at all those comorbidities and create, um, put that together in a SQL table so that it was ready. Um, we could also look at the hospital data, which is the, uh, the SUS, secondary use of service um, inpatient data. Um, so, you know, hospital level, spell, record level. Um, so once a patient's actually in the hospital, what happens when they're there? Um, we also had information around what patients are living in care homes. We thought that would be a um, really useful thing to bring through as, you know, people in care homes could be proxy for other conditions that they have and frailty and things, but actually there could be a heightened risk of patients in, in care homes as well. Um, and we also brought through some information about what patients are using um, quite high cost um, drugs for certain um, conditions. Um, and then once uh, we brought it into the data science studio, so this is a bit how it looks on the on their flow. So if you start from the um, 
and the starting data sets and those blue squares, those uh, correspond to those uh, eight SQL tables. So you load them in, um, IT kind of sets it all up for us and, and we put the uh, connections in place and things. And then the yellow circles are um, uh, recipes which you use within uh, data IQ DSS to transform data in some ways. So some of them are doing things which you would normally do in in SQL. So it's, you know, fixing kind of date formats and things like that, um, deriving uh, additional columns, you know, having um, if statements and logics and, and things like that. Um, other things it can do is, you know, it can create um, distinct lists of patients from other sources, so you can bring that across. Um, so some of these, I mean, the nice thing about it as well is you can do it, it it's quite flexible in how you set those um, transformation kind of recipes up. You can click through and just do it just from kind of clicking your mouse and it will kind of guide you to set them up. Um, you can write them in the um, programming language of, uh, of your choice, um, I think. And there's also there's some um, transformation recipes where if there aren't any pre-built ones which do the job, um, you can also create uh, custom ones in Python or R. So we had a point uh, towards the end of the project where we wanted to get our hospital data, uh, which was kind of record level. We wanted to get it into a uh, time series. Um, so there wasn't a pre-built recipe to do that. So we wrote one uh, with data writers help. We wrote one in uh, Python uh, to do that. Um, so then you get uh, towards the end and once you've got kind of our data the way we wanted it, we then um, joined it all together and ended up with a combined data set. And that's what we are going to run our model on. The combined data set, um, just so it helps kind of visualize it, um, it was about 35,000 records, um, one for each patient in Southwest London who had chronic kidney disease stage three to five. Um, lots of different uh, columns for, you know, um, comorbidities, demographic information, things like that. And then at the end, a yes, no flag to say, uh, did this patient have an emergency admission in the last 12 months? And that's the, quite the key column because when then we get it to the modeling phase, that's what we want to be trying to predict. We want to say of those 35,000 patients, you know, I think seven and a half thousand um, had an emergency admission. Is there something common for all those? Uh, indicators and those patients which we can use to identify the risk factors. So this is our um, model uh, metrics. So once we um, built the model um, and, and to build the model as well, I, I should say, um, you know, you, you get the data, you then run, um, you can then build the model. Building the model was quite intuitive. I think um, for us anyway, uh, you know, we we use the kind of auto machine learning kind of functions which would build the model. You'd say sort of broadly um, you want to run this type of algorithm against it um, and then you can run a lot of those models in parallel. Um, you can also say, you know, what variables do you want to actually include? So you might start from a point of view of saying, well, actually you've got lots and lots of variables, but then you might quickly realise through running a model that some of them just aren't relevant. So you drop those out, run it again, and it becomes kind of more uh, accurate. Um, and it will tell you things like, you know, your um, uh, R squared kind of score and coefficients and things. So we then kind of go through a sort of iterative process of, of running the model, looking what the outputs are, checking that they make sense. Maybe you have to revisit your data, maybe you think, oh, OK, now I need to bring sort of something else through instead. Um, which went on for which went on for a few days. Um, and then once we've got a model where we were quite happy with it, um, this is the uh, metrics which it then shows you and you can evaluate that model on. So overall, um, the model predicted 70% uh, of um, all predictions accurately. Um, so this table sort of in the middle, we're saying actually one means the patient did actually have an emergency admission. Um, predicted one are the what the models predicted were an emergency admission. So out of 1,444, emergency admissions, the model correctly predicted 967 of them. So majority, which we thought was really good. You can see there in if you read downwards from the predicted emergency admission of those 2,150 emergency admissions that were predicted, um, 1,183 of them weren't emergency admissions. So it did have um, it slightly over predicted uh, some false positives there. But overall, you know, we thought um, we thought this was a good result. Um, in that we could, you know, predict the majority of the uh, emergency admissions and that the outputs that we had 
uh, made sense and were consistent. Um, and also what you can do as well, which is quite good. You can, um, when you run the model, you can just run it on, you know, 80% of all your observations, um, hold 20% of them back. And then once you've got the model, you can then, and this is all quite easy to do, repoint it at those 20% of other observations, which the model hasn't seen before. And then you can see the outputs on that. And if they're consistent with what you've already got from your main model, then it's quite encouraging because you could say, OK, probably then if um, this as this model is kind of exposed to more data, the results are consistent. That's good. Um, just moving on a bit, to some other um, functionality that you can do uh, within um, the data IQ is it allows for kind of interactive scoring. And this is a good way of sort of um, uh, testing the results that you've got were consistent. So in this case, um, we can sort of build a profile of hypothetical patients to understand the change in the probability of them needing an emergency admission. So in the case of this patient, um, so this particular patient, 39% um, chance of uh, needing an emergency admission. You can see from the factors sort of on the left, they haven't had a history of an emergency admission in the previous year. They're from a non uh, BAME background. They don't live in a care home. They haven't had any high cost drugs. They don't have heart failure and there are more as, as if you were to go down. Um, but then you can sort of say, well, what if actually we change this profile to say, what if this patient were to live in a care home? So you can just uh, change that out and then what you can see there is that the probability has increased up to 59 percent. They've gone over a 50 percent threshold of being um, more likely to need an emergency admission. So you can see how um, drastically these things can affect uh, things. And it's a, a sort of a, um, a marker that in controlling for other factors, there's quite a uh, inherent risk in patients needing a care home is what the model was saying. Um, you can also see at the bottom there, the most influential factors have changed. So now um, the care home present flag is the most important thing for patient needing emergency admission and pushes in the green, which makes it more likely. Um, so these were some of our uh, model results, um, which we had. Um, so typically you can see, you know, variables makes significantly more likely to need emergency admission, um, history of emergency admissions, high cost drug use, certain comorbidities like cancer, being prescribed cardiac medications and other heart conditions, um, care home, uh, residency, older age groups, um, moderately more likely, um, history of smoking, um, diabetes, uh, diabetes, obesity. And uh, we were unable to find a significant result for some factors as well, which was um, slightly surprising because um, our clinical colleagues thought we would, particularly ACE inhibitors or um, antigenin uh, receptor blockers, they were uh, they're normally prescribed for patients with um, hypertension, and uh, our, our clinicians did tell us you know that that can have impacts on patients who have kidney um, conditions as well. But interestingly, we we didn't see any. Um, uplift on uh, any extra risk factors on that and didn't see any um, heightened risk as well for ethnicity groups, gender, um, mental illness or deprivation level. Um, right, so uh, th th this next one is, is one of the kind of key results I think that we that we found um, was that uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, we used a um, custom kind of Python script to turn it into a time series. So you can see it any sort of, we're looking at kind of 1920 uh, data for this, and this is the occupancy in southwest London uh, by day. So you can see it averages for all patients around about somewhere between 200 to 250. Obviously, once March 2020 happens and COVID, the figures really change a lot because of uh, known reasons in, a, in a hospital occupancy. But um, Patients who are on anti-inflammatories and cardiac uh, medications can, um, can account for about 75 to 85 percent of the total patients. Now, um, the clinicians had a hypothesis here that um, some of those cardiac medications and anti-inflammatory drugs are known to cause issue of kidney um, with kidneys for patients with CKD. So if there was a means of moving those patients to um, a medication uh, drug regimen which doesn't have those adverse conditions, then potentially we can free up some beds if you could avoid those emergency admissions. And we thought we could um, eight 
beds at any one given point in time um, was a reasonable um, assumption. All needs to be kind of tested in practice, of course. This is just sort of hypothetical. But those are um, the main real kind of results in terms of the actual project. Um, I just want to touch on some of the, the key organisational benefits which, which we found. I mean, one of the things I think particularly which we weren't expecting at the start actually was kind of how well Data IQ did facilitate um, collaborative working. Um, particularly, you know, I mean, it's something we struggle with at, within our teams when you have people um, within the same team who might be working in different organisations when collaborative long projects can be a real challenge. Um, even with kind of you know modern means of using teams and things but the nice thing about this is when when you log in you can see very clearly what your uh colleagues who have also been working on the on the modeling and the data prep and things have been doing while you're away um it, it kind of shows up to you like a timeline of all the things that are different they've worked on things and it just makes um starting up again and working at a, that much faster you know a lot faster than when you're doing it a similar thing in you know excel or sql server or something like that um we found the um the platform and the process of using it um really easy to pick up um we used quite um quite a lot of the training materials which was excellent um we uh were supported by data iq uh data scientist who was uh brilliant in guiding us and giving feedback and suggestions and and saying where we were going wrong and things like that um so we we set ourselves two months for this proof of concept and we landed it um within that time um so yeah, that that was uh it works right according to plan from that point of view um yeah clear audit trial of work carried out um it's very easy to see once you go back into your models and your transformation recipes exactly what's going on you pick things up um and what's happened you know very quickly um you, you can go back and see why things were done you can um put in sort of wiki articles and stuff like that for project documentation within the uh, project, which is really useful when you've kind of made assumptions um, about how to calculate things like that. Um, and yes, I think I mentioned earlier as well, statistical models, um, very fast to build, um, very, you know, a lot of um, explainability and different ways of showing the same information, some of which I've sort of touched on during this, um, during this presentation. Um, the last real uh, slide for me, I think. So um, we, we're currently uh, just about to kick off a phase two of um, the proof of concept. Um, we're, we're taking a bit of time as well, sort of in parallel to um, try and just verify sort of our results, um, just, you know, statistical kind of rigor and things like that. Check, check this absolutely does make sense and try and get sort of a third party uh, peer review of the uh, statistics. Um, we also probably want to revisit just a little bit of our data to check that some of the um, results we found were consistent. Um, the phase two of the proof of concept, which we're starting, is we want to sort of make it real and make it operational. Um, well, the way we're kind of planning it um, at the moment is that we'll have a way of kind of surfacing the information for the most at-risk patients and uh, hopefully piloting this with a, um, a GP to say actually if this was you know sent to you in a certain format, maybe by email, top five patients at your practice most at risk or something like that with explanations of why our models found that they're most at risk and then you know what what would we be asking um as colleagues to uh to do you know uh, proactively to hopefully prevent the admission um in the first place and then also building a kind of front end dashboard where colleagues could if they had you know time and willing to sort of log in um from primary care could log into a dashboard and actually see more information about their patients um, so I think that's the um, that is the last slide for me. Um, is there any any questions anyone has? I'm happy to take them now. Or I can take them afterwards. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, so we'll just kick off with that. So uh, hope I say this right, Shireen. Elizabeth has asked, what did you do in regards to missing data and how much missing data was in your data sets? Oh, thanks. Yeah, and um, we we did have this. Um, so I think something like maybe 5% of our patient cohort were missing um, comorbidity information. Um, so DataIQ allows uh, you a few different ways of dealing with this. 
um, you can either exclude those patients entirely from the model, you can make an assumption uh, about what the status is for each of those indicators by by column, um, or you can apply an average, I believe. Um, I think though, as in our case, as it was the same 5% of patients for all columns, we just uh, we we chose to exclude those patients completely from the model. Hope that answers the question. Uh, anything further to that, Shireen? You feel free to take yourself off mute. Was that it? Um, no, no, no. That, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't have more missing data. Actually, I'm pretty impressed with you know only five percent. But yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Great. The next one we have is from Nikki Doyle. She says you took 2019 data. Would the model come up with different results if we look at the different data due to the impact of COVID or does this model take this into consideration? Yeah, I think I think probably um, it could well do that. Um, so one of the things we will need to sort of explore as we kind of operationalize it is building a kind of a current uh, a current model and testing it on um, current data. I think there could well be some extra, you know, COVID flags and um, and things like that we need to uh, pull through um, as a way of dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you expect that to be starting from scratch again, or do you think you can just adapt what you have? I, th I think we can. I think we can adapt it. Um, I mean, it, it it would hopefully be the case of you know bringing through a few more kind of uh, variables and modelling it. Um, but I think I think that a bulk of it will we can reuse what we've currently got. Yeah, because um, the data set hasn't really changed. It's just uh, bringing in extra bits. Great. Um, then the next person asks, uh, uh, Maria says, what are the advantages and disadvantages when comparing comparing using R, for example? Um, so I I um, haven't used um, R to do uh, modeling myself. Uh, my colleague has, and uh, from showing it to her, she thought this was a lot uh, more kind of intuitive and E more easily to pick up from someone who's not a coder, but um, I don't I don't know myself in one honesty. I haven't used my car studio for, uh, for doing that before, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'll jump in and say something here as well. I, I, I'm more of a the front a front end developer than a proper data scientist or anything on, on the, along those lines. But what I've really loved by in seeing the product is the collaboration and the fact that it can bring together everybody within uh, the data landscape. So we're looking at clinicians right through to business managers um, and team leads, but including everyone in between business analysts, data analysts and developers, data engineers, and then the data scientists themselves and everyone singing from the same hymn sheet. Everyone's using the same language. Everyone's looking at the same project. Everyone's able to have a conversation about it. There's a lot of good explainability and transparency uh, naturally within the program, which allows everyone to have the best conversation about it because we need the whole team to make these things happen. So I think that's a huge benefit in comparison to something like R, which is just, to be honest, is a bit of a black box for everyone except the data scientist. The data scientist knows what's going on and they have language, can understand, and can explain, but then bringing everybody else to the party, it gets very difficult. And I've not seen it happen particularly smoothly in many places, to be honest with you, um, even within the NHS. So I think that's one of the primary differences that I see is being able to bring everyone's expertise in the entire life cycle and landscape into the conversation and, and to guide things from there. So would you say that that's been your experience, Steve? I understand you're not a data scientist yourself either. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with what you said, yeah. It's, um, it, it really is. It, it is great for that. OK, great. Um, the one thing to add, Rowan, if I could very on, quickly on. Yeah. To, to that point, um, is actually that there's, there's no reason why you can't carry on you know, coding in R uh, and working the way that you are today if you're a data scientist. Um, you, know, you can carry on doing that in an IDE of your choice or actually directly within data IQ or literally copy and paste that R code into data IQ. So if you're a data scientist using R, you can really carry on working in the way that you are today. But perhaps the benefit, as you were saying there, Ron, is that by doing it in the context of data IQ, you're able to 
much more effectively collaborate with your non-coding colleagues and, and to a large degree almost you know have those non-coding colleagues do a lot of um the the upfront work possibly you know a lot, a lot of the data preparation data cleansing for example that can be done very very easily and effectively in data for iq which makes the whole process far more efficient so if you are you know if, if you are an r coder that's fantastic you can carry on working in that way within data for iq um, but by using that collaboration you talked about rowan you're able to effectively deliver projects much more quickly as an overall team so and that's kind of how it's complementary to um, our, our coders out there in the community. Hope that helps answer your question. Maria, do you want to? Yeah, I think she said thank you. So, so that's great. I, I also want to add in, I, I have the privilege of having quite a global role with my company across the NHS. And we're all aware of a lot of siloism that goes on within the NHS and a lot of reinventing of the wheel. And I think something like the flows that data IQ um, uh, present and the way that everyone can have the conversation it means that that piece of our code which is creating the model uh, in some circumstances other models can be used which are more automatic but if you're going to make the model yourself then because it's in that flow and it's because it's a part of that whole conversation and it's understood and it's in context I think the ability to collaborate and share that across the NHS just explodes a little bit as well so instead of every different uh, sort of ICS or region um, developing their own uh, plan for for kidney failure and so on that can just be lifted from there and and be dropped in somewhere else and that conversation globally across the NHS can be happening a lot easier so there are plans in place to try and make those things happen a bit more and maybe Sean will speak to that a bit later but um, I think that's the bit that really excites me as well whereas uh, I think if it's just the data scientist who's doing the work and involved with the work and knows what's going on it, it's harder to bring that globally across to everybody. So that's a piece that I'm quite excited about. Yeah, it's, it's um, a good point, Ron. So if you're writing our, our code, for example, you, you could package that up into what we call a plugin, which is effectively a, um, if you like, a, a widget or, or a plugin that other people can use. So it really helps foster that reusability uh, across you know, all ICSs, really. So you know, hopefully it means that people won't be reinventing the wheel over time, but they can actually leverage the best practice R code that's being written uh, by virtue of creating a plugin or a reusable asset. So yeah, it's a very good point, Ron. Great. Um, cool, let's keep going. Uh, so the next question is from Kieran and says, did you exclude some emergency admissions if they weren't related to CKD? Um, we didn't. We actually looked at um, all emergency admissions um, and then when we um, did some additional kind of modelling around uh, length of stay, we um, looked more on what the sort of length of stay is by specialty, which the patient had been sort of admitted to. But no, this was just um, this was all emergency um, admissions. Great, thanks, Steve. And then Beth asks, what ML model did you use for the study? we the uh, the the final one we ended on was um xg boost which is from a decision a decision tree model but um i i don't know much uh much more than that in terms of how it actually works kind of under the bonnet um, yeah sean do you want to just touch on the fact that data iq offers multiple models and then recommends which one uh, based on performance yeah, exactly, Ryan. So the way that we do it within our kind of auto machine learning capability, which is like a guided, you know, capability really. Um, if you have a, a data set, you can select any number of you know, common ML models out there. Um, and it's actually we, we do it via open source and scikit learn. So they're all well known, you know, um, you know used approaches. Uh, that's available in the open source community but effectively what data iq does is um allow you to sort of select 10 20 30 possible models and run all of those against your data and data iq will then tell you which of those models are the most accurate given the data set that you've provided so then you can actually toggle all the other models off and then start to do that iterative analysis that Steve talked about earlier on with your preferred model, if that makes sense. You can start doing the what if analysis, 
based on the most accurate model that data IQ is recommending to you. And you can then start to get much deeper into that model. Hope that answers that question. Yeah, I also just want to touch on the fact that data IQ is not a replacement for data scientists at all. Like the core part of the work, you really do need those people who know exactly what's going on statistically as well as uh, technically with the coding. Um, it's just bringing it's bringing what they do into a place that everyone can get hold of a bit bit, bit better and can can govern it well and can. Uh, collaborate and bring in sort of the expertise from you know right down to the clin clinicians uh, up to the business manager I spoke to before but that core part is, is it's not it's not auto ml in the sense that it's just plug and play it, it needs it needs people in the middle to to make that happen so it's kind of just bringing everyone to the table um next question is from anthony it says 45 percent of your predicted admissions act actually admitted do you know if this is an acceptable level of accuracy for the audience, i.e. GPs, how would those emissions be avoidable? Thanks. Um, in terms of GPs, no, I think that's going to be one of the questions from the second phase of the proof of concept will be um, will be what they what they do think about that kind of level of accuracy. Um, though um, we've had some good feedback so far from our um, hospital clinicians uh, on that being a good level of accuracy. Um, how would those uh, admissions be avoidable? Um, so it could be um, it could be in terms of um, you know looking at the drug regimens that um, patients are on. It could be you know additional kind of uh, checkups and things like that. Um, I think we'd be we'd probably be guided from um, primary care in terms of what interventions uh, they think would be uh, comfortable making it. And I think this will come out of part of the second phase proof concept when we sort of narrow down the scope of what will you know, frontline GPs actually be asked to do with this information we're sending them. We need to then understand actually what's, you know, what what is realistic to ask them to do and what do they think would be a kind of a useful uh, prompt. Yeah, I'd also throw in that like this is the benefit of being able to choose different models, like in different clinical situations, a false positive would be more dangerous, uh, uh, but misdiagnosis would be less dangerous. But in other situations, it might be the other way around. And so, even if there's a lot of false positives, it, it, it might not cost too much to um, to preemptively take care of certain people. Just knowing that you're going to catch most people who would end up being emergency admissions will have huge health benefits and cost saving benefits. So this is where, you know, not just being stuck with one model, but having many to choose from which have the have the accuracy in the area that you really want can be quite powerful. So in fact, Steve, I don't think your presentation particularly mentioned the uh, the predicted benefits um, in terms of health and cost that we've talked about before here. Do, do you want to just touch on that quick? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it uh, definitely, um, you know, emergency admissions are quite high cost and obviously have a big um, a cost implication with, um, you know, staff and resources and things like that. So anything to, to reduce that um, is really good. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, evidence out there that, you know, did, if you can avoid kind of patients going to the hospital in the um, in the first place, then you can improve their overall kind of outcomes um, long term. So it's a it's a win win. Great. Um, next question is from Christopher. It says, can you reuse the model for different diag different diagnoses? Yeah, definitely. So um, it'd be very adaptable to do that. It would just be a matter of kind of changing uh, when we've got the data from the preparation stage before it goes into DSS and changing that in our uh, back end to look at different diagnosis and yeah, absolutely it would, it would just follow straight through and the model would then be applied to that kind of new data set. It's actually one of the questions which came up of our, our um, public health colleagues when we um, talked to them about this model was one of their questions was well have, have, have we built a model specifically for CKD patients or have we built uh, a general model for an older population group um, and they just happen to have CKD. Um, so we tested that by looking at the whole population and we found that the results were still sort of consistent and reasonably um, similar, but they were way, they didn't produce the same level of accuracy as our current model. So we think there is something in what we've built for specifically for CKD patients, but I think with a little bit of uh, 
tweaking, um, you could apply it to other um, patients with different diagnoses as well. Yeah, that kind of goes back to what we we're saying earlier. Like personally, that's one of my real hopes for the NHS is is better collaboration across across the entirety of the NHS, which is a, 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 something we were all aiming for, but it's so hard to achieve. But this does create an opportunity where people don't have to start from scratch, but can edit what's there and can um, you know bring in have that conversation across and and yeah, uh, and I think that's that's pretty exciting. Um, Next is James he says, did the data get split into training data that got used to define the rules of the algorithm and then apply it to the actual data? Or am I confusing that with neural networks and deep learning? Um, yes, if I, if I understand correctly, so yes, we had we had 80% uh, used for the training data, which built the model, and then it was tested on the remaining uh, 20%. Um, so yeah, I hope that I hope that uh, answers it. So yes, we we did do a split from training and testing data to build the algorithm and then apply it to um and then apply it to data. Yeah. Great. Um, I want to jump ahead and come back because I think uh, Maria's question might land quite nicely into the bit that Sean will do for us, but. Uh, James, Anthony James says, have you considered where the ethics approval is required for work like this? Yeah, absolutely. I think as we now go and this becomes, you know, less of a kind of a an academic exercise and a bit of study um, and, and it becomes too operationalized. Um, yes, definitely. Ethics approval is something that we need to consider and talk about um, and check with our um, colleagues from lots of different kind of disciplines and whether we've kind of got that right. Um, yeah. Um, really important. I mean, ultimately, you know, if it becomes operationalized, we'll be asking people to kind of make take action based on what produced. And we need to be really clear on what the uh, ethics and the, the bounds and the um, uh, is for that. Yeah, very important. Now, Sean, do you want to touch on that in terms of uh, data IQ features which allow governance to happen easily? Uh, you're on mute, Sean. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> uh, yeah, the whole concept of responsible AI is something that you know we take very seriously, actually. And we, you know, you, you could probably um, Google you know, that topic and, and data IQ um, and and kind of find some really interesting talks we've given in the past. Uh, but it's, it's a really good point. And obviously, with any, you know, not just data IQ, but really any machine learning, any data science, or any AI, even. Um, Ethics and responsibility is a really important point. And there are plenty of examples where things have gone wrong in the industry, um, where perhaps you know uh, machine learning models have actually given recommendations that have been biased or skewed in, in some ways that actually um, have really led to some serious questions being asked around ethics and responsibility. So um, it's, it's a really important topic that I think we all need to work through. Uh, I think it's pretty fair to say that we're at the earlier stages of doing that within the NHS, but it's one that is really important and really should be considered. Yeah, I just because partially relevant as well, I'll just say from an IG perspective that data IQ doesn't house the data itself, it kind of just processes it. So that's also made a little bit simpler, but um, obviously we can have further conversations on that. So uh, let's close off with a question from uh, Maria, which ties off to what we were wanting to talk about anyway, which is great, um, which is, is data IQ available for NHS staff? So, Sean, do you want to talk about any next steps for anyone who's interested in the sandbox and POCs and things? Yeah, no, sure. Um, so, yes, it is available to NHS staff. So, um, there are some uh, ICSs that have actually bought data IQ uh, and are building out a production environment um, so they can do similar projects to the one that Steve's led with the London Kidney Network. Um, so North East London, for example, uh, are doing that currently. Um, and if you want to get more involved, um, you, you absolutely can. So um, there's a, a data IQ training environment that we've created specifically for the NHS, um, which means that you can access any of the online data IQ Academy content. And, and undergo any of those 60 or 70 training courses that you want to, um, but leveraging your dedicated 
training environment for the NHS. Um, you know, another option could be that you could go on to dataiq.com and sign up for a trial environment. The problem with that is it's time box, so normally that only lasts for about two weeks. So the environment that we've made available to the NHS it isn't time box. So it means you can take as much time as you want to complete as little or as much of the training that's free of charge um, to learn how to you know, use these types of data science techniques uh, and in particular using data IQ to do that. Um, so the other thing I'd suggest as well, you know, if there's a, a project or um, you know, a study that you would like to do, um, you know, please feel free to, you know, to reach out to me. You know, we'd love to you know, work with other lighthouse teams in the same way that we've done with Steve and his team. Um, you know, perhaps on the same topic or different topics. So at the moment we're, we're kickstarting a project with North East London around predicting the complications of hypertension. Um, we're in discussions with South West London uh, about predicting the implications of uh, obesity or those patients that are likely to become obese in the next 12 to 24 months. So yeah, if you've got a, a project or a proof of concept or something you'd like to test, um, yeah, we, we'd love to work with you. So please do free, feel free to reach out. Um, my email address is actually in the slides. I think it's on the, the next slide in Steve's pack here, um, but it's Sean dot taylor at dataiq.com so if you'd like to get involved in the trip the free training and access to your dedicated nhs training environment or if you'd like to talk about a proof of concept that we could work with you on free of charge um please feel free to reach out to me hope that answers your your question maria joanna it does it does thank you Pleasure. Great, I just popped your email in the, in the chat there if anyone needs it as well. And obviously, if, if you want to talk to us about different options and, and things like that from a kind of tool agnostic point of view, you're also welcome to reach out. That's what we're here for as well. Um, Sean, was there anything else that you wanted to run through before we wrap up? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so, Ron. I think Steve's done an amazing job of talking through the project. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, Steve, that we can share these slides more widely. If people have you know, other questions, they can reach out to you or myself or, or Rowan. Um, but no, thanks, Steve, for your time today. It's been really, really interesting. Thanks. thanks Great. Yeah, so, Steve, well. if you can just go back to the very first slide, I'll just do a final wrap up reminder um, about uh, Interworks Assist um, and our next session as well. Um, there we go. So yeah, just to remind you to reach out to assist if you need anything. Um, and also that we've got another, our next um, webinar is in two weeks time on the, um, let me get the date, make sure I get the date right, the 8th of April, and that's to do with uh, new Tableau tips and tricks in 2022. So thanks so much for giving us your time. Thank you, Steve. That was really interesting and, and really helpful, a really fantastic presentation and hopefully one of more to come. Thank you, Sean, as well, for talking us through everything. Yeah, please do reach out to any of us or all of us um, for anything that you need. And uh, yeah, we'll let you have a couple of minutes of your time back and see you in a few weeks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.